Fastening his seatbelt, the bureau member's motions were crisp and boring, like the kindergarten teacher on John's first day. He hadn't liked her from the start. She was impersonal somehow, and new, not from any place he'd ever been or ever wanted to be. And now he was being driven to a place just as unfamiliar, where things were meant to be put right, or at least as much as possible, considering how badly it had all gone. A catastrophe, they called it. Preposterous, they saw it as. Why even attempt such an absurd thing in the first place, not to mention put so much at stake? The headlines went worldwide, and the reactions around the world were not kind. Everyone was talking. Now, groomed and dressed, and somewhat handsome this way, he sat quietly in the courtroom, the focus of an international event. Despite making a good appearance, he seemed lost, like an amnesiac just released from the hospital and then appointed CEO. You stand accused of acting in direct opposition to the statutes 167A and 173A, C, and D of the Bureau of Global Science and Eco Management. Looking around the room, which was full of former colleagues, the Bureau Board, and a gathering of spectators chosen by lottery in the back, and at all the cameras, all of it bearing down on him, John, who had always tended to remain oblivious to the scrutiny of others, still couldn't help but feel a pang of humiliation over this one. He looked out the window into what must have been winter by now. He recalled his first kiss. He was a child beneath the streetlight and the snow began to fall. The judge's gaze cleared the rims of his spectacles where it seemed to gather energy and bore down from his high position on the dais where he sat flanked on either side by the bureau chiefs. By the time his glare reached John, it was a concentrated beam of equal parts anger and bewilderment that he was willing to do little to disguise. I have decided to depart from my formal role as an impartial judicator of international affairs just this once, in this one special occasion, so that I can ask you, because the world in its own right wants to know, because I myself am personally impelled to know, and because this is surely to be the only chance we will have to examine the vagaries of such a reckless and deviant mind. What were you thinking? John looked up, blinking at the judge. Did you not attempt a similar venture during your tenure at the Bureau of Global Science? Taking John's silence as a cue to continue his tirade, the judge went on. And was your research not found by peer reviews to be not only devoid of scientific merit, but frankly, dangerous? Hmm? And were you not instructed to desist in this line of research due to the certain volatile elements that were a part of the apparatus used in your experiments? John hadn't formulated a reply. He didn't like it when people asked him a slew of questions before even the first could be answered. It created a list in his mind that eventually frayed about its moving edges and turned into noise. Yet nonetheless, you did persist, clandestinely, in carrying out the underwater experiment. And then, after you were divested of your title and relieved of your post at the Bureau, you continued to pursue this on your own. And even still, you continued in your stubbornness, not dissuaded by our repeated interventions, wherever we were able to catch on that you were still trying to hatch this irresponsible project of yours. Well... Worried that he might lose steam if he stopped now, the judge spoke up again before John could reply, though he hadn't yet made motion to. Anyone possessing even a passing familiarity with the Bureau guidelines would grasp the notion that your particular experiment, to put it mildly, is 
outside the scope of what we would ever allow. In other words, it was an awful idea. And in addition to being just bad science, the amount of risk involved ought to have given pause to any sentient individual. And anyone with some sense should see that. By now, there were several sedated grunts of affirmation and even a few scattered applause. Yet you went ahead and precipitated the largest environmental disaster in recent history, in known history, <laughs> in any history, anywhere. And why? Why? So you could teach fish to talk. At last, John spoke, first clearing his throat. The purpose was to decipher the communication of all marine life, not only fish. Several times during the preliminary trial, the judge had claimed to be at a loss for words, though it never seemed to be the case. Yet at this, he was earnestly speechless. And then for what seemed like a very long time, he stared down at John in unfeigned disbelief. Finally resigning himself, the judge seemed to gain a new air of calm. We will continue with this trial without any further diversions into your motives, which, frankly, are all beyond speculation. But I will have you know this. These proceedings are purely a perfunctory arrangement, doctor. You will be given a trial because you are required to have one, and as long as you remain part of the human race, you will be extended the same dignity that is given to each of its members, down to the last, regardless of how little they deserve it or how recklessly they've abused it. But you will be found guilty. And once we have conferred, you will no doubt be sentenced to banishment on the island of Equietus Paru, where from the moment upon your arrival, you will continue to live and breathe, but as a singular entity. You will be spared your life, yes, but you will go forward without ties to anyone, without mother or father or wife or daughter or friend, because in lieu of capital punishment, we have all agreed that the sentence which better suits the crime is banishment. Not from the tribe or country, not from parish or sect, but from the human race at large. You will reside as the sole inhabitant of your own private island, meant to house a creature that is wholly unlike any other that has ever walked upon its shores, an entirely unique species. By that I mean you, Doctor. You are on your own. I expect you will find the grounds to be quite well furnished. In fact, preparations are already underway. It is our intention that you will have every comfort as you contemplate the rapaciousness of your actions, which will long outlast the span of your life on this earth. <laughs>